So listeners, we just learned hot off the presses that Campaign for a Commercial Free Childhood has changed their name and is now Fair Play. And you can reach them at fairplayforkids.org. They have the same great mission and the same great vision. Technology is such a fantastic advancement and we get information incredibly quickly and I've come to expect it almost to the point of having trouble differentiating when the workday ends and home life begins. We have to be intentional about our boundaries and we can certainly make those decisions for ourselves, but what about our families, loved ones, and particularly our children? What if we are the family that sets boundaries, but my child's best friend's parents do not? How do I manage that? Am I alone in thinking this? Welcome to Small and Gutsy, a podcast featuring interviews with nonprofit and social impact organizations under $10 million. My name is Laura Whitkoff, and I'm excited and proud to be your host. My hope is that you love the stories as much as we do, and perhaps you will find needed services, a job, volunteer, invest in, or donate. Feel free to pass along any valuable information you hear today to others, and remember to send me the name of any organization you'd like featured at reachus at the Intrinsic Group. Campaign for Commercial Free Childhood works to create a world where children's lives are shaped by what's best for them, not by corporate profits. Their advocacy is grounded in the overwhelming evidence that child-targeted marketing undermines healthy development and the belief that society bears responsibility for and benefits immeasurably from the well-being of children. Campaign for Commercial Free Childhood holds corporations accountable for their harmful marketing practices and advocates for policies to give children the commercial free time and space they need. One of their key projects, the Children's Screen Time Action Network, is a global membership organization born out of the needs of educators, pediatricians, and other professionals working with children and the families they serve who are concerned about childhood tech use. They see that overuse of digital devices is negatively affecting kids' well-being and encourage children and families to spend less time with screens and more time in creative and active play. The Children's Screen Time Action Network is a coalition of practitioners, educators, advocates, and parents working to promote a healthy childhood by reducing the amount of time kids spend with digital devices. I am so very excited to introduce my guest today, Josh Golan, Executive Director, Campaign for Commercial Free Childhood, Jean Rogers, Director of the Children's Screen Time Action Network, a project of Campaign for Commercial Free Childhood, and Seth Evans, Chair of the Screens in School Work Group of the Children's Screen Time Action Network. Let's get started. Welcome, Josh, Jean, and Seth. Share with me your passion about CCFC and the Children's Scream Time Network. And I think it might make sense if we start, Josh, with you as sort of the umbrella organization, and then Jean, Seth, jump in. Thanks, Laura. It's so great to be here. So CCFC was founded um, in 2000 by Dr. Susan Lynn, a psychologist who worked with children and was increasingly concerned about how their play and their sense of self and and uh, and their behavior was being shaped by marketing aimed at children. At that time, 2000, we were primarily concerned about television commercials. It was before the iPhone and the iPad and, and mm-hmm. all the digital media that we have today. But Susan was already seeing that childhood obesity, that eating disorders, the erosion of children's creative play, all these pressing issues were, were linked to advertising to children. And so she started talking to people that she knew in various professions, pediatricians, teachers, people who care about children. The seminal moment in CCFC's founding was when Susan found out that the advertising industry actually gave out awards for the best advertisements to children. They had something called the Golden Marble Awards. And Susan was just horrified Mm -hmm. that they would give out awards for who could best manipulate children, not who could create, you know, the campaigns that got children eating healthy or outside or doing all the things that were good for them. How could they manipulate children for profit? And so she called some of those friends that she had had connected with who shared similar concerns. And she actually organized a demonstration outside of this uh of these golden marble awards and they are they they gave out their own awards called have you lost your marbles but a very serious topic for sure it got a lot of press 
the advertising industry actually, after two years of these protests, actually canceled these awards. And, and Susan realized, like, not only is this a huge issue that's very much under talked about in how it's shaping child development, but, you know, there are so many people that are concerned about it. And we need a we need an organization. We need people working together to try and solve the problem. A couple of years after she founded it, I actually happened to read an article about Susan leading this this demonstration. And I, and I said, oh, my God. This is the most amazing thing I, I've ever heard of, and, and I want to be involved. And so I had actually, prior to coming to CCFC, I'd worked at Miramax Films for a number of years. I'd worked as a first grade teacher for, for a year. You know, when I was at Miramax, we had a film called Spy Kids. Miramax cut a deal with McDonald's, and a lot of the scenes in the movies took place in McDonald's. Mm -hmm. And everybody at Miramax was like, this is great. We found this new revenue stream. Mm -hmm. And I said... Isn't anybody concerned that we are using our quote unquote art to sell kids on the worst possible junk food they could be eating? Like, isn't mm -hmm. it enough that we're already taking $10 a ticket? Mm -hmm. And everybody looked at me like I had six heads because the concern there was not the well being of children. Nobody was setting out to harm children. It wasn't their charge. Their charge was how do we make the most money off of families? So I realized that, that Miramax wasn't a place for me. And I ended up going back to school to get a child development degree. And that's when I read about. The campaign for commercial free childhood and and i reached out to susan and connected and started as an intern we we weren't even small and gutsy we were minuscule and gutsy. Um, <laughs> it was susan and me you mm -hmm. know if i backed up my chair in my office chair i would bang into susan because we were you know sitting back to back in a tiny office at the time all we wanted to do was raise awareness of these practices some of our campaigns we started re they started resonating they started growing all of a sudden we started winning and then we, you know, we added to the team. By 2008, we had an enormous team of four people. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't think any of us thought 20 years ago that CCFC would be doing the things that it's doing today that would be one of the leading watchdogs of the media and marketing industries when it comes to children. We just wanted to, see, you know, yell, this is wrong. And then over time, we started to realize, you know what, we can do more than yell. We can organize people. We can be strategic. We can actually do more than raise awareness. We can change some of these corporate practices at companies that are literally thousands the size of, of what we are. So that's where we are today. And, you know, in, in the interim, you know, I hired Jean and she started the Children's Screen Time Action Network. And we're still, we're still tiny. We're, um, we're six full-time employees and two, two part-time employees. But we have been able to change the practices of companies like Google and Mattel and mm -hmm. Disney uh, and the NFL and, you know, some of the biggest companies in the world. We have, we have forced them to treat children better. And, and now we're, we're working hard on legislation that will change things on an even bigger scale. This is one of the most under-talked about issues of, of the world, is that children are growing up in an environment where they don't get a chance to be children first, where they mm -hmm. are consumers from the, almost the moment that they're born. And mm -hmm. these enormous commercial pressures that we put on children shape who they are. They shape their values. They shape their behavior. They shape their view, view of the world. And some people say to us, sometimes they say the campaign for commercial free trial to what does that mean? Like, does that mean cover up a child's eyes when they see, when they see an advertisement? Does that mean move to the woods? And it doesn't mean anything like that. It means something very simple. It means that the institutions and people who interact with children, the primary influences in a child's life, should be people who care about what's best for a child, not people who are looking to make money off of them first. Mm -hmm. So I want to make a couple observations. One is you're not disputing, dismissing, or dissing the technology and the world of what exists. What you are doing is saying who's accountable. By the way, I wish we could replicate you for adults because everybody gets inundated and it's hard to plow through and manage. And to have that expectation on our children is completely unrealistic. And we've taken the ownness away from the adults who are producing it. So thank you for taking an interest. Thank you for devoting your life to this. And so I want to now kind of move this to Jean. I want to hear about your passion, your involvement, and about the project. So like Josh, I started in a different industry. In fact, I was in the advertising industry as a copywriter. I always like to say I was on the dark side <laughs> um, before I came here. And um, when I started at CCFC, we were doing Screen Free Week, which you may have heard of, and it's coming up again the first week of May started as turn TV off week. And then when we inherited it, of course, screens are everywhere now. Yeah. And um, especially during COVID, uh, screen free week is something different. It's certainly not screen free, but it's whatever you can do. We invite 
families to pledge. And if you can have a screen-free dinner every night, that's amazing. If you mm -hmm. can do one screen-free Saturday during the week, that's great. But something that makes you think about those boundaries you talked about in the beginning. Yeah. And so I started at CCFC in 2016 after getting my master's in education. And Josh said, you know, I think that there are other people out there working to reduce children's screen time that might feel isolated and that they're professionals. They might feel discouraged because it feels like an uphill battle, what we're talking about today, because we are going up against those corporations that are convincing parents that, you know, the iPads and the apps are the right thing for young children. As a parent educator myself, I had been preaching this in small community groups, PTAs, faith communities, and not really getting the message to a wider audience. So we thought we would bring together these professionals, which in fact, yes, they were feeling isolated. And whether they were pediatricians, mm -hmm. psychologists, school psychologists, parent educators, um, social workers, and create community among people who have the same values we do and work to help parents. And the philosophy is not telling parents what to do mm -hmm. either because they, right. they, you know your children best if you're a parent. It's guiding them. It's giving them the information they need about child development and understanding that if children don't play, they miss important developmental milestones. We have our Action Network Live webinar series where we're able to interview the experts on specific topics like I video game addiction. Yes, That's we did a COVID series, which helped people because at the beginning of COVID, we were all freaked out. <laughs> Life is on a screen and what do we do from there? We give the parents access access to the professionals and able to ask them questions directly. Jean, is that through a network that folks, anyone can join? Absolutely. Membership okay. is free, is currently mm -hmm. free. Um, anyone can join the Action Network. It's professionals and parents. In Great. fact, we had our first conference in Boston in 2018, oh, and that's when we started getting calls. We kind of envisioned ourselves as a professional network. We started getting calls from parents saying, I'm just a parent. Can I come? Mm -hmm. Of course you can come. In fact, we found that um, people come as professionals and parents. That's why we hired Seth. We felt that schools, a lot of parents were saying to us, you know, we've been following you for years and we get it. We're managing screens at home. But then we send our kids into school now and it's everywhere mm -hmm. and they're on a screen all day and then they have homework on the screen. Mm -hmm. And um, I heard a statistic the other day that venture capital investments in ed tech increased from 4.8 billion in 2019 to 12.6 billion in 2020. Obviously the ed tech market is capitalizing on what's happened to us during COVID and leaving those families and kids vulnerable. I remember when, and my kids are older now, but when my kids were much, much younger, we did participate in the week of screen-free week early on. And I, I didn't really recognize the connection to you all uh, in that. And I actually wanna make a, a push for anyone listening to this. I think we as adults should think about doing a screen-free week in May. I think it's a beautiful thing where we all can benefit because creativity stops for all of us when we're passive learners. And some in the environment of a screen, and I'm not against them, I think they're, you know, technology is amazing. We wouldn't be able to do this Zoom if I didn't, you know, couldn't do it or the podcast. But I do agree so much with the premise, and I am so appreciative that you invite parents to join this network because it's so informative when you are battling, as you called it, an uphill battle around what's out there. And even more so with COVID because we're all forced for good reason to stay healthy, to be on screen. So I myself am gonna pledge the first week in May to be outside of my Zoom work that I have to do, right? I'm gonna be screen free. And I'm gonna see what creative juices fly. And I really will encourage all of my children, wherever they are, they're adults, young adults living in different places, to do the same and everyone I know. I wanna help promote this. I think what you're doing is absolutely beautiful. Whether you were previously on the dark side, it was a good, it gave you a good foundation to now promote this in a, in a different way. Seth, I'm gonna pass the baton 
and hear about your engagement and involvement in your passion. Well, first I want to say I was never on the dark side, so. Okay, okay, you get a pass, okay. Thank you, Laura, and it's <laughs> so inspiring to hear Jean and Josh talk about the origins mm -hmm. of our organization. Josh talked about the relatively small size of our shop, but it's just amazing the amount of great work that comes out of it. And I was on the CCFC mailing list, and I had already started thinking pretty deeply about these issues about screen time. As a teacher, I was, as a fourth, fifth grade teacher even, I was seeing the effects of the screen-based culture on the learning readiness, on the behavioral regulation of the children that were coming into our classrooms. I was concerned. I started talking with parents of some of the kids whose behavior was the most dysregulated, and almost inevitably, those were the kids who were spending the most time on screens. Now, mind you, these were nine, 10, and 11-year-old kids, their, their brains were not as learning ready. And uh, we sometimes diagnosed them with ADD. We sometimes uh, had to discipline them by keeping them in for recess because of the interruptions. But, you know, I really was not satisfied that those were the answers because there was something about this generational change that couldn't be explained by other factors. So when I learned about the first Children's Screen Time Action Network conference, which was 2018, the year I was retiring, I was thrilled. And mm -hmm. I said, oh my God, this is great. And I signed up and uh, at the conference, I was, I couldn't stop talking. I was raising my hand, raising my hand. And I ended up going up to Gene and Josh, I believe, and said, I'm probably gonna be retiring at the end of this school year. I wanna work with you guys. And fortunately, we figured out a way to make that happen. The Action Network does a lot of things. It provides resources, it provides education, uh, but I'm kind of an old organizer type and I really wanted to try to put the action into the action network and uh, I think bring that, a little bit of that perspective there. So our work group, which is consists of, like the rest of the network, parents, educators, academics, advocates, um, you know, we've taken on a lot of projects and that's where a lot of the work of the action network comes in. You know, Gene manages all the webinars and runs it all, but there's six or seven work groups now, and our work yeah. group has engaged in some very productive projects. People really want to make changes. They don't just want to read about how bad things are. And so mm -hmm. we created a toolkit to help parents uh, who are dealing with these issues where they don't want their kids to be spending so much time on screens. We've supported uh, work group members who've introduced legislation in their states, and we also create resources for parents and teachers. I personally have a passion for working with teachers. I am still active in my Massachusetts Teachers Association or statewide teachers unions, and they're very concerned about the issue of mm -hmm. screens replacing teachers in schools and, mm -hmm. and the model of education that is being put forth by the ed tech companies, especially in this time of kind of disaster capitalism. We're really worried now that all the screens that have been introduced during the pandemic are going to be clawing to stay in a prominent place in school's curriculum, and it doesn't uh, merit that. It's not that we're against technology in schools, but we want to be tech intentional. We want the use of the technology to be informed, evidence-based, and whenever possible, really transforming the learning, not just replacing pencil and paper. The tools and the fundamentals need to be there first, and that the technology can really be a supplemental piece. Exactly. How does a campaign and the network intersect? How do you all connect and interface on a regular basis? Well, these days we connect and interface over Zoom, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, okay, fair enough. You know, the CCFC, the, the, the parent organization, we work on a lot of national campaigns targeting uh, corporations that are, that are doing some of the most harmful marketing to children. We also advocate for policy at the federal level. We do a lot of filing of complaints that the Federal Trade Commission against companies that are engaged in unfair and deceptive practices when it comes to children right. or, and, and violating their privacy, which mm -hmm. is increasingly a, a huge concern. Um, and the network, it's this great mix 
of, you know, its parents, its professionals, you know, teachers. There's no hierarchy. People who have written books who are coming to work group meetings, sitting next to someone who is a, who is an active parent in their PTA. And there's, and, you know, and, and the expert learns from that parent in the PTA and the parent learns from the expert. And together, right. it's so much more powerful. It's national and it's international. We have international members as well. Right. But and we're very encouraged by our members, especially our work group members who come to the network, they get to know the professionals and their peers, and then they go out and advocate themselves. Then they get the courage to go out and advocate themselves, sometimes from their own experience and from the help that they get from us and from their colleagues in the work groups. And our work groups are, um, for example, mental health professionals. They've gone to the APA and called attention to the fact that psychologists can be paid to work on the manipulative apps, the apps that are manipulating children and their parents. Um, so advocacy like that is invaluable and it starts with collaboration. Mm -hmm. Micro partnerships happen where people find a colleague across the country that they can work well with and they can reach parents in a different bigger way. Wonderful. So just for the listeners, the APA is the American Psychological Association. I'd love to get a sense of do you, how many work groups do you currently have? And can someone start a work group once they're part of the, if they see a need? I just would love to understand more of the operations. Absolutely. So the work, we have six active work groups right now, and they are mental health professionals I mentioned, mm -hmm. parent educators, early childhood Screens in Schools that Seth is mm -hmm. chair of, um, and two new groups that we've just started, an interfaith work group, which is pretty interesting. People of all different religions coming together to understand better and share with faith leaders how screens are impacting kids' character development and their spiritual development. The last one is cyberbullying and online safety. How do they start? How do you get them going? What's sort of the internal process? The four original groups that we started, the four first ones that I mentioned were started at our conference, the one Seth referred to in 2018. Um, but since then, a topic will arise and someone will come to me and say, like the interfaith work group, that it's an interest we have, let's try. And then usually we need a leader, someone who is good at organizing, has a little bit of extra time and is willing to um, chair or co-chair a group of people, you know, in very different time zones, having mm -hmm. different professions often, and it might be a little difficult to get them together, but when they come together, it really can be magic and how they empower each other. In the early childhood group, we had a preschool teacher just beside herself at the beginning of the pandemic, not knowing how she would connect with the kids, with the families. Mm -hmm. And through the help of her colleagues in the work group, she was able to develop techniques where she would have the kids go find something blue I, I go find that. you know go find your favorite stuffed and i'll do so she's able to get them to do things off the screen even though she mm -hmm. must connect with them on a screen do you then have the resources available for someone maybe new to the network who can who might be in a dilemma and say i want to see what resources are available is it codified in some way where people can access this information be able to utilize it maybe report back or add value it's a couple of ways laura we have a resource library where people are welcome to share resources, um, but we are curating those resources and keeping the most helpful ones noted. We have a weekly news you can use newsletter that goes out with four articles that we've seen this week because we've found that what's so hard is to keep up with the changes mm -hmm. in technology and how it's impacting children. Once you join a work group, they work together online and they're always updating each other and collaborating. It's uh, very exciting to see projects now bubbling up from the work groups rather than from me or from Jean or Josh. As an example, a group on its own started a campaign that is focused on the Department of Education strengthening the children's privacy laws regarding educational data. And that mm -hmm. bubbled up without my involvement, but uh, I've since been able to support that group. I want to ask a little bit about the topics of webinars. Uh, Jean, you mentioned some before that you provide, and I assume that's open to any member. 
to participate. I'd love to hear a few topics. I'll let you know some topics that we have covered, Laura. We have had a webinar called Be TechWise with Baby for expecting and new parents because it's often, you know, you're not thinking of the technology world that the child's being born into. You're thinking about how am I going to get this baby to sleep? What am Mm -hmm. I going to feed them? So that's um, one of the topics we've covered um, TechWise teens. We have teens in our organization, two teens on our advisory board who created a um, resource called Dear Parents about communicating with parents about their cell phones. We've covered self-care for educators, how to go back to school during COVID and not be plugged in all the time. We've covered video game addiction. Is it video game addiction or not? Digital wellness overall, a lot of early childhood topics as well. So if you can think back on a year ago, basically, how did you respond? What did you do? How did you think about this? I know we're a year beyond that, but it's been a very stressful trying year. With everything during this pandemic, there was a real progression. And, you know, like everyone, we had no idea of the the length of the arc of what we were looking at when we first, you know, on March 12th, when we said goodbye in our office and said, you know, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, We had no idea that a year later, we still wouldn't have been back in our office. Our advice at at the very onset of the pandemic was don't worry about screen time. Like Mm -hmm. there is a pandemic, keep yourself safe. If your kids are on screens a lot for the next couple of weeks, you know, you have enough to worry about. And and so don't worry about that. And then we quickly realized like, oh my God, this is not going to be over in two weeks. This is not going to be over in a month. And in fact, you know, there is the potential for the habits that kids develop to last a lifetime. And that's really, really concerning. Gene can tell you a little bit about the webinars that we launched right away. I mean, uh, we, we had like 900 people on our first webinar wow. Wow. Um, about COVID and, and managing screens. And so, so Gene can tell you a little bit about that piece. But what I'll tell you about is we quickly realized that there was a couple of different issues. One was what happens this year. Everybody's screen time was gonna go up this year, but how they could maybe keep it, manage it a little bit. From a parent organization perspective, what we were really concerned about was that the things that happened uh, this year were gonna become permanent. Um, We know that when schools invest in things, then they start looking for for reasons to justify their investments Mm -hmm. rather than thinking about is this, you know, is using a screen at this point the best for children? And in fact, the companies were incredibly strategic. So many companies gave away their stuff for free this year, Mm -hmm. knowing, you know, with a business model that they were gonna start Mm -hmm. charging when the pandemic was over or when the schools became completely dependent on them. So one of the things that we did um, in the last uh, in the last couple of months is we filed a big complaint against an app called Prodigy, a, a math game that is used in schools. Um, and, and Prodigy, what they do is they tell uh, schools that it's free and it is free to the schools, but then they encourage kids to play at home. And when they play at home, they just get bombarded with advertisements for a membership and not just advertisements. They use the freemium model that is so popular with all apps these days where the mm-hmm. kids can play for free And they see all these cool things that they would like to get, like things to get for their virtual character and cool spells that they can cast as as a wizard, but they Mm -hmm. can't access them unless their parents fork over the money. And to make things worse, if their parents pay for a a fairly expensive subscription, they then get advantages, they move through the game quicker, it looks like they're better at math just because their parents have paid, and their classmates, when they're playing in school, these, these advantages still confer. So the kids, some kids are walking around in, in this virtual world with all these cool things and other kids don't have them. And so it creates this whole new form of inequality based mm-hmm. on who can pay for a membership. So we were appalled by this and we filed mm-hmm. a Federal Trade Commission complaint and we're meeting with the FTC uh, coming up this week. Mm-hmm. Senator Markey and Representative Castor uh, in the House of Representatives sent a letter to the FTC saying, you have to take this seriously. Right. And a lot of press around this. And now we're, mm-hmm. or, you know, Seth is working with our members to organize them to try and get it out of individual school districts. Not making this the new normal was, was our mantra. Um, mm-hmm. You know, once we realized that we weren't gonna all be back in, in school and in our offices two weeks later. 
Yeah, congratulations though that you really um, put forth and really review things that are coming out and push against a model that is so destructive for most of us, but particularly for kids. And then you're right, it creates this lack of equity within a system where everyone has the right to learn. And it really makes that disjointed. And also I think is a misnomer that, p that kids think they're learning and advancing when in fact they may not have even practiced the fundamental skills that you need outside of the app. And that's hugely problematic. There's a line of thinking by some of these ed tech companies. Kids play so many video games now that you have to make education as much like a video game as if you want to interest kids. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening is, you know, and then they show, oh, look, kids want to play this game. And, and isn't that great? But all that's showing is that kids like video games. It's not showing, you know, it doesn't transfer to that the kids like the math in the video game. In fact, in mm -hmm. Prodigy, the math is by far the most boring part. So you're a wizard in this game. And it's not mm -hmm. like you're trying to figure out how many spells do I need to use in order to advance. And what the math is just, do a, a problem like what's five times four? And then if you get that right, you get some wizard points. So it's completely decontextualized from yeah. the game. And so it actually what it teaches kids is that math is boring and video games are fun. And math is like vegetables that you eat in order to get your dessert. Rather than enjoying the vegetables for the vegetable's sake. Yeah, right? yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, the pandemic certainly has accelerated some of the trends that were already there. These were trends that were operative well before the pandemic started. In some ways, in a way, it's really confronted parents with the reality of what a computer-based education would look like, and most parents don't like it. That mm -hmm. doesn't stop the, the companies who've invested so much money, or the school districts who now have invested money in purchasing some of these systems from trying to push it. But at least it didn't happen in an insidious way. We were kind of slammed with it right in our faces. And so I think in some ways we're better able to make informed decisions now. I don't know if you've, if you've had the pleasure of seeing kids, you know, after they've been cooped up on their screens during the pandemic for, for weeks, get together outside with their peers and the sheer joy. Kids might think that all they want is screen time all the time, but this pandemic has even taught kids that there is something so much better than screens. And, and mm -hmm. really, some of the most moving moments I've had during the pandemic has been watching my daughter or just watching kids in a playground, the, the joy of rediscovering the, each other face mm -hmm. to face. We have a newfound appreciation for, for being together and, and, and prioritize kids being together face to face without devices more because we are all so starved for it right now, particularly yeah. our children. Kids want to be in school for the social aspect of it, you know? So you want to capitalize on that as much as you can because part of making that connection is what kids need to develop that aspect of their social development, as well as it informs their cognition, informs their emotional health, so on and so forth. Yeah, it's really true. We are now faced with the calls for catching up. We want to catch everybody up for all the lost learning or the mislearning. And you can imagine what that would look like they would be, there are no teachers, first of all, who are have the bandwidth to teach summer school. This would be probably kids in large classes on computers doing paced learning, which is, to call it learning is generous, instead of the things that kids really need right now, which is the things they miss most about school, the social, the extracurricular, the music, the art, the play. It's true. I think about even when my kids were younger and I didn't have th this kind of battle in the same way that parents have today, the um, concept of art and music programs being cut in public school started this trajectory to focus on the cognitive development, not recognizing that arts and music and extracurriculars inform that in the most beautiful way. When I think about the future of both the network and uh, CCFC, what do you see? Uh, I know growing your network and addressing some of the policy piece, uh, what else do you envision? One thing that I garner hope from is our teens I mentioned earlier, yeah. is that they are recognizing themselves and they're coming up with solutions on how to mentor younger children. And that takes that power struggle out of it that you were just mentioning, mm -hmm. which is really a big problem for families is once they get into the power struggle, they either give up 
or they're getting you know additional tension to the tensions that they already have to the stressors we all have right now that's a direction you're going i'm all for it because i think when teens are able to teach younger folks they also teach their parents for me, this is a really incredibly exciting moment. Um, you know, Jean talked about creating the network to help people who felt isolated. I mean, I felt isolated for years. And what we have seen in the last couple of years, you know, with films like The Social Dilemma and more and more attention, you know, as, as the problems have become too great to ignore, very few parents who will say, I'm happy with my family's relationship with media, and yet, they really struggle to change it. The reason for that is because the technology is so powerful. It's not that it's not that screens are bad. It's not that um, apps are bad, but the business model, yeah. the business model, which is about keeping us all on screens as much as possible to collect as much data, to deliver as much advertising to us, and to, and also to deliver the content that is going to keep us on screen so they can collect more data. What is exciting to me is that for the first time, people are recognizing that all of these problems that we have with media, whether it's you know teens' mental health, or whether it's kids not getting outside enough, or whether it's people being susceptible to disinformation, or cyberbullying, or the online sexual exploitation of children, all of these have a common root, and that is the business model of engagement and trying to collect our data. For the first time, we are seeing people speaking up about that business model. The number of people that we work with in Washington, D.C., who want to put some brakes on that business model is greater than it ever has before. And I have some hope that we can actually start to change that business model. Mm -hmm. um, and if that, if that happens, you know, then the parent education that we do will be so much more effective because right now it is such a battle to work. You know, we have the most powerful persuasive technologies that have ever been created. Mm -hmm. and we're using those technologies to get kids to want to buy stuff. And what, what a terrible use of powerful technologies, right? We think if we can get at the business model, if we can start to get these companies to design their, their, their products, not for maximizing engagement, but for other things, that it will make the parenting piece of this so much easier. Small and Gutsy is sponsored by The Intrinsic Group, my boutique management consulting firm specializing in guiding organizations to leverage talent, optimize processes, and to ensure the organization's narrative is aligned with their culture. We'd love to invite you to be a sponsor. So if you're interested in sponsoring Small and Gutsy to keep it going, please reach out to me at reachus at theintrinsicgroup.com. As you may or may not know, toward the end of our my podcast, I always ask a round of quick and gutsy questions. So if you all are ready, they're fun. Don't get nervous. They're really easy. So what is at the top of your wish list? And the answer can't be money or funding. The top of my wish list is to um, ban behavioral advertising, that's data, the advertising based on all the data they collect from us to anybody under the age of 18. I'm with you, Josh, and then my additional wish is anyone over the age of 18, I'm kidding, but I'm not kidding. My wish list <laughs> is <laughs> bring uh, the national teachers unions into the coalitions that CCFC is trying to build to support meaningful legislation to really challenge the business model. Top of my wish list is that we'd be able to get some of this really important child development and screen time information to low income and families of color that might not have had the time or um, accessibility to know this information ahead of time that we'd be able to spread it to people who really need it. I love that. Thank you for that. If you were to think of a song that describes CCFC or the Children's Network, what would it be? And you can make a choice of whichever. You don't have to do two songs. I'm going to say Lean On Me, I think, <laughs> because I think, you know, we're here and we want people to know we have the resources. We're doing the work. Um, join us. Depend on us for this information. You can trust us. Thank goodness you all are there. Josh or Seth? I was raised on uh, old folk music, and um, if I had a hammer, a song about organizing, a song about um, people coming together to make enormous change. I'm also a fan of folk music and a child of the late 60s, early 70s, and I, I'm thinking of the Joni Mitchell song, The Big Yellow Taxi, how they oh. paved paradise and put up a parking lot. I, I uh, see the 
replacement of play uh, with screens is taking over from kids' outdoor play and engagement in a three-dimensional world as being a big danger. We're trying to prevent that. What makes your organization gutsy? It's definitely gutsy, but what do you think makes it particularly gutsy? I think it's our, our, our fearlessness in taking on companies that are, um, you know, so much bigger than ours. Um, you know, in, in 2019, we forced Google to make major changes in how they treated children on YouTube. Great. And I did the math. Um, at the time, our, our annual budget um, was about $500,000, which was what Google made in revenue in an hour and a half. All credit goes to Susan Lynn, our founder, who taught all of us, you speak the truth and you can't worry about the consequences. If, if, if the truth that you have is, needs to be heard and if children are being harmed, you have to speak up. That's all there is to it. And, mm -hmm. and you don't stop to, to worry about what does this mean for my career? Or what does this mean for my funding? Or, or am I gonna get a cease and desist letter? And we've certainly gotten our share of those. Mm -hmm. um, you, just, you just do what has to be done. And, and uh, I'm forever grateful to Susan for teaching me that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what makes us um, gutsy. I think what makes us gutsy is our volunteers do so much. We'd never be able to do it, just the six of us. So Yeah, it takes a, it takes a village, a big, big village, right? A national and international village. I was going to say, David and Goliath, I, I just know that Josh and Jean and the other full-time staff, they really love being David, and it energizes them. And the bigger the challenge, the harder they fight and the harder they work. So I couldn't be more proud to be associated with a group like that. Yes, it makes you all gutsy because you're in it together. What is something that outsiders or maybe even a few insiders don't know about your organization? And when I say organization, both aspects of your organization. Uh, I think one thing that, that most outsiders don't, don't know, and maybe even some insiders, though this podcast is going to blow that up, is just how small we are. They look at our webpage and say, you know, you must not have you know, your other 40 staff members on, on the website. Why is that? Most people who, who hear about us or, or follow us have no idea that there's only six of us and two part-timers. I think it's an amazing thing that not only do you project bigger, but my guess is it's because you do big things. The people don't know when, when it comes to parent education, we're not going to tell you what to do. We're not going to tell mm -hmm. parents what to do, that we're going to offer guidance, but we're going to offer resources but that we're going to, most of our parent educators in the network work to help you come to your own solutions. Because mm -hmm. every family is different, every person is different. If you have a child with a disability, your home's gonna be different with screens than it is with ch children without. We're not gonna tell you what to do, but we're gonna give you all the information to help you make your decisions. You're not control heavy, you're resource heavy. And that's a beautiful thing because as you pointed out, Every family is a little bit different. Every family has different levels of resources, capabilities, capacities. And so you're not guilt inducing, which is beautiful. You're really about here's some resources, here's some ideas, and you'll work with individual families if they're stuck, it sounds like, which is really remarkable. I'd like to just add to what you said about us being resource heavy. We are resource heavy in the one hand. On the other hand, we could really use more help. We would love for more volunteers. We have committees that really could absorb some new blood all the time. And there's more projects that we would take on if we could get more people who are willing to spend you know, some time volunteering for some of our action networks. If you could get, and I'm sorry about this question, given all that we've talked about and sort of the internet and social media stuff. So we'll think, think about this one. If you could get one celebrity or influencer to talk about, endorse your organization, either the campaign, the network, both, who might it be? Because it is a, it can be, as we've all talked about, technology can have a positive impact if used well and impactfully and effectively. Prince Harry, <laughs> he's a young father. He's also talked about how social media disconnects us. Um, and I think speaking to his generation and with the um, megaphone that he has right now, especially, mm -hmm. I'd love to have him on board. And look at the negative experience he's had. This That's would be right. such an opportunity to do something super positive. I'm going to go with Michelle Obama, just because <laughs> her concern for children's health has manifest through her work on child obesity 
but also just the way that she is able to communicate with young students of color and um, her warmth and her caring about all these cultural issues would she'd be an amazing spokesperson i think she should be a member let's get her to sign up <laughs> that's what i think yeah. and megan and prince harry get them all to sign up that's what i think let's start there we have seen so many people come forward after they've left silicon valley and say mm -hmm. god what we were doing was terrible and i feel bad and now i'm going to try to atone for it i would like to see a ceo currently in silicon valley stand up and say you know what what we're doing is harmful to children and we're going to change i want to tell you how joyful this conversation was for me today mainly because i didn't know all the groundbreaking work you have been doing over the last sounds like 20 years the way in which each of you has come to the table from different perspectives and different experience adding tremendous value to helping all of our children have a better sense of themselves, the world around them, and their own capability by accessing their creativity and their cognitive ability and their social and emotional well being. And I cannot thank you enough for doing the work that you're doing and for spending this time with me today. Thank you so much, Laura, for having us. Thank you, Laura. This was great. I'm committed to the beginning of May for Screen Free Week. I love that outside of any scheduled uh, podcast that I have to do, but outside of that, I am a firm believer in lots of other things that I can be doing. Thank you for listening. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends, give us some stars and write a review on Apple or wherever you listen to podcasts or buy us a coffee, buymeacoffee.com backslash small and gutsy. Here's a comment from Beth P. Small and Gutsy is actually a giant innovative platform of opportunity for nonprofits and for-profits and all of us to share in the good these organizations offer our communities. Each podcast offers a gateway into the inspiration, mission, and great minds behind an effort with public benefit. Laura's well-researched, relational, and enthusiastic interviewing style elevates each initiative, drawing us into a taste of the organization's life. Not only is Small and Gutsy celebrating and inviting support for a rich plethora of small businesses, but it's also enriching our minds and lives as we listen. Hopefully, these opportunities to journey with a community farm, to a camp serving transgender youth, heroes of color, to programs supporting those navigating homelessness and loss, offer us all ideas and pathways for making our world a better place. Wow. Thank you, Beth P. Truly, your words are inspirational, and it's people like you that help us continue to reach out to these nonprofits and for-profits that truly have an amazing impact. Thank you so much for your comment. I want to thank my partners in this endeavor, my co-producer, sound engineer, and composer, the amazing Pavel Franson, my exceptionally talented graphic designer, Nate Addy, my social work intern extraordinaire, Stephanie Tran. Please check out their bios on the Intrinsic website and all the folks, friends, and family who have guided and inspired me. Our blog of these small and gutsy nonprofits and social impact organizations can be found in the organizational story section of the Intrinsic Group website so that we can continue to link clients, volunteers, future employees, investors, and donors to this small but mighty network. Of course, we can take responsibility outside of our own vetting of the organizations we interview. So before you sign on to support or work for them, we encourage you to do your own due diligence and research them as well. We just want you to learn about the small and gutsy nonprofit and social impact organizational sector so they can spread their story and their impactful work. From small and gutsy to big with impact, I'm Laura Whitkoff, and thanks for listening.